Hello again, dear students. I hope you are enjoying these lessons in sociology. Today we are looking at the third lesson on sampling, and we intend to wrap up with this section of the syllabus. In this lesson, we are going to consider the non-random samples, systematic sampling, snowballing, quota sampling, purposive and opportunity sampling. We will also consider generalization, which is very closely connected with the issue of sampling. First, let us look at systematic sampling as a method of non-random sampling. Systematic sampling is a sampling method in which a member from a large population is selected according to a random starting point and the subsequent members selected with a fixed periodic interval. I'll explain this to you in detail in a minute. The interval is called the sampling interval. It is calculated by dividing the population size by the desired sample size. What does all this mean? Suppose the population is 1000, we're talking about the population of a school for instance, and we want a sample size of 100 out of this 1000. So what we do, we take the population 1000, divided by the sample size, we get 10. In other words, the interval between each sample being chosen will be 10. We start at the random starting point. In other words, from the first 10, we draw the lot and we see which number comes. Suppose the number is 7. So we know that, like we said earlier, according to a random starting point. So we start at 7. Then we go on 17th, 27th, 37th, up to 997. By the time we reach 997 will have obtained our sample size of 100. We may take another example. Suppose the sample size should be 50. Therefore, the sample interval will be 1000 divided by 50, that is 20. So the number chosen will be first number 7, followed by 27th, 47th, 57th, up to 987. By that time, we will obtain our sample of 20. The next non-random sampling technique we'll consider is quota sampling. In quota sampling, the sociologist decides to collect data from a predetermined group. This will depend on the research interest and the aim of the researcher. For instance, in market research, a sociologist might decide that he needs to interview working women who have a child below the age of five. So the researcher decides that he will study working women and he will uh, interview 50 women who have a child below the age of five. The choice usually is on a first available, first chosen basis. This is done in market research. Usually the researcher goes out and finds the person. It might be in a public space where such people are easily available. And the person who comes across, if the person fits the type of respondent he wants, in other words, if the woman happened to be a mother of a child less than five and working woman, he decides to interview that person until he reaches the quota of 50% with similar characteristics. Therefore, quota sampling is a sample drawn on the basis of some predetermined characteristic of interest to the researcher. The selection would be on a first available, first chosen basis. Data collection is stopped once the quota is complete. You should note here that all the persons in the category of working women, for instance, with a child below the age of five, do not have equal chance of being selected. 
Equita sampling is not a representative sample of the population. The next method of non-random sampling which we will study is snowball. You are not probably familiar with snowball but a snowball becomes bigger and bigger because it gathers more snow as it rolls down a slope and this is why our sampling technique is also called snowball you will understand it in a minute in a situation where the sociologist does not have access to a full list of participants he cannot have an idea of the whole population Therefore, he has to start with a few persons he knows, or even one person, and this person might help him contact other persons. So the sample grows gradually, like a snowball, until the sociologist obtains the desired number of respondents, which he feels it's enough to gather data for his study. When he says respondents, we mean people who would answer the questionnaire or agree to be interviewed. You should by now understand why sociologists resort to snowball as a technique for data collection. Can you think of this reason why snowball is used? And an example of a research which would require the use of snowball sampling technique I told you earlier that snowball technique is used when it is not possible to identify the population from the start let's take an example suppose a sociologist decides to study drug addicts the population is not known. Therefore, he can only access a few through personal contacts and subsequently build the sample through additional contacts of the previous respondent. And therefore, you should also understand that using Snowball as a sampling technique will not provide a representative sample because the sociologist cannot identify the whole population from the start. Therefore, a snowball sample is one where the researcher starts with a known person as the first sample unit and expands his sample as the contact grows until the desired number of respondents is attained. The next technique of non-random sampling is purposive sample. In a purposive sample, the researcher decides on the nature of the sample, then she chooses the people or the group who meet the essential criteria. For instance, suppose a teacher wants to study a mixed ability classroom with repeaters and first-year students in the same class. She may decide to choose a grade 9 class where there is the highest number of repeaters. She decides to do a case study of only one class. Obviously, all repeaters do not have equal chance of being selected. There is another method of non-random sampling called opportunity sampling. In an opportunity sampling, the researcher chooses those who happen to be available at the moment. This is based on the convenience of the researcher. This method might be used to check a problem on a small scale or in market research. By now, you must have uh, guessed the difference between a random sample and a non-random sample. What is it? In random sampling, 
every member in the population has equal chance of being selected because they are known at the start and this is what we have been talking about simple random stratified randoms cluster sampling earlier in the non-random sampling every member of the population does not have equal chance of being selected because they're not known at the start or sometimes the researcher may wish to study a smaller group for his convenience each member of the population may not be easily identified or the researcher makes a choice more appropriate to her research objectives there is another concept closely linked to the issue of sampling that of generalization a sociologist cannot study the whole population it is too expensive or time consuming I did hint about this at the beginning of this lesson on sampling it is not necessary to study the whole population most of the time it is possible to study a smaller representative sample result from the sample can be used to understand the whole population I gave you an example earlier the sociologist does not study the whole school but a sample of 20 percent what is found for the sample is considered to be true for the whole population and the result can be generalized to the whole school population let us recapitulate again what we understand by generalization generalization is the application of the result obtained from a sample to the whole population the positivist use carefully designed statistical methods on a representative sample therefore the representative sample allows generalization to the whole population generalization is not possible with non-random sampling such as snowballing or quota sampling because the population is not known and they don't study a representative sample thus positivists do not use non-random techniques they use random techniques which would allow them to get representative sample and subsequently allow them to make generalizations we can represent this idea in a diagram you have the population from where you draw a representative sample and the conclusions from the representative sample holds true for the sample as well as for the population as a whole so it can be generalized to the population from where the sample was drawn the next thing that we can consider is whether sociologists are always interested in generalization obviously the answer is no generalization is not always desired nor necessary generalization is only possible when the sample is representative the positivists are interested in generalization generalization is not always desired nor necessary the interpretivist study small groups the concern is an in-depth understanding of small samples discovering meanings behind human action they use participant observation case study of a small sample sociologists do not always study a representative sample mainly because all sociologists are not interested in generalization it is proper to link it with the theoretical approaches especially interpretive sociologists while you talk about the issue of generalization 
how they are not interested in generalization as much as the positivists. Let us recap what we did in this lesson today and through the last three lessons. We differentiated between random and non-random sampling and we looked at the different non-random sampling techniques which were systematic sampling, quota sampling, snowballing, purposive and opportunity sampling. I explained to you how different sociologists make use of sampling and I explained generalization and why not all sociologists are interested in generalization. Let's now look at some of the questions you could attempt on this topic on sampling. I just wish to remind you that in a 15 marks question you should be able to give a proper introduction, examples, explain your arguments for and against, and explain why we should agree or disagree with an issue with a proper conclusion. When I say why we should agree or disagree, it doesn't mean you or me. It means who are the sociologists and from which perspective they're speaking and what are the arguments they put forward to agree or to disagree with the issue under discussion. Some of the questions listed here will require that you refer to the lessons we did previously. The questions are, what is a representative sample for marks? What is a non-random sampling for marks? Differentiate between a random and a non-random sampling method, six marks. Why do positivists prefer a representative sample six marks. Give two examples of non-random sampling four marks. Explain two types of non-random sampling eight marks. Do sociologists always use a representative sample 15 marks? Assess the view that sampling is essential in research 15 marks. Assess the view that only the positivists are interested with sampling. 15 marks. These are a bit tricky questions and the answer should be quite elaborate where you give clearly an understanding of the issue. What is a representative sample for instance? Who uses a representative sample? How do they do it? What are the techniques? and whether everyone uses a representative sample. Here you have to differentiate between the positivist and the anti-positivist. We will discuss this question later in another lesson. But if you look at the questions carefully, they are quite tricky. Sometimes you might have the feeling that you could answer such a question in just a few lines, but you should be careful. It might require around 500 words plus. We have reached the end of this lesson and the three lessons on sampling. Next time we will look at another section of the syllabus. You can now obtain this lesson on YouTube. Go to MIE Hub. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope you have enjoyed it. I just wish to remind you that this lesson has a few illustrations which have been used from an open source unsplash.com. I hope to see you back again very soon. Goodbye.